United States has never experienced a drug addiction epidemic like the one we're experiencing today. So how did we get here? face of the opioid crisis. In the last week, 15 people died from drug overdoses right here in Cuyahoga County. And while addicts younger in age may come to mind, half of these recent deaths were people 60 and over. It is a troubling new trend that is not only emerging here, but across the country. Jeffrey Brown reports she outlines what's fueling a growing public health crisis. The death toll nationwide is staggering. A record 72,000 people died of drug overdoses in 2017. Overdose deaths were up 10% in South Dakota. More people are dying from drug overdoses than HIV, car crashes, or guns. I've told people this. I would rather my child get AIDS than to be an addict. <laughs> because it's easier to treat AIDS by far. Make no mistake about it, it's affecting our entire country. It can happen to anybody. The Centers for Disease Control and Prevention says the opioid epidemic is getting worse. This is the epidemic of my generation. This is my HIV, this is my black plague. And a stark new report shows the opioid crisis seems to be deepening across the country. This is the worst drug addiction epidemic in United States history. Overdoses are increasing at an alarming rate. Since 1999, more than 300,000 Americans have died from an opioid-related overdose. Our country loses more people to overdoses, prescription drug overdoses, than we lost in the entire Vietnam War. I mean, that's a staggering number. But we're experiencing that right here in Oklahoma. In fact, if you looked at the map, of how the opioids are advancing across the country, you would see the state of Oklahoma rise out of that because of every county uh, in our state is seeing a rise in opioid deaths per 100,000. And so that allowed it to fester and grow for two decades before we, as a society, looked around and said, holy crap, this is everywhere. Epidemiologists don't even think we're anywhere near the peak of it yet. You know, sometime after 2020 is when it's predicted to be. So we're, we're not even close. Well, the opioid epidemic is unique among most drug epidemics in that it is not picking which social class. And it's decimating the entire society at all levels. It's like nothing we've ever dealt with before. The sheer numbers of people, when you look at the overall society who takes pain pills, so many of us do. Essentially, what opioids are, are a version of heroin. The effects produced by hydrocodone, or oxycodone, or heroin are indistinguishable. An experienced heroin user cannot tell one from the other. 95 million Americans were prescribed an opioid in one year. 95 million Americans were prescribed a drug that's every bit as addictive as heroin. And we were at the top of the list for the number of people who were being prescribed and the number of prescriptions we had available and pills in our community. As the prescribing went up, rates of addiction and overdose deaths went up right along with the increase in prescribing. It's not a drug abuse problem, it's an addiction epidemic. However, what happens when they take that pill is it changes the brain. Their brain chemistry has changed, and their life is forever changed. So it tells me that it's not a personality flaw, it's not a character flaw. This is a, a biological mechanism. If people are so uncomfortable about talking about addiction still, I know people still to this day who have shared with me that their loved one is struggling. Thank you for saying something. But they don't want to say it out loud. But they don't want to say it out loud. And I cannot tell you how often this happens, at least a couple of times a week. Your brain is telling your, your body to seek out this substance just like it should seek out food and water and everything else you need to survive. The problem, though, is the priority. When you eat food, your body sends out a signal saying, hey, you should do that again sometime. But when it's with opioids, it sends it out that you need this immediately. And so there's a lot more priority on it. As you descend further into addiction, you really start to displace everything in your life to prioritize the addiction. If we took the brain and drew a line 
we could divide it just easily into two parts. The prefrontal cortex, which is the part of our brain that is responsible for our learning and our judgment and our reasoning ability and all those things. Well, the limbic system is the more primitive, responsible for sex instinct and hunger and thirst and those kinds of things. Addiction sort of hijacks the limbic system of our brain, the part of our brain that's responsible for pleasure and euphoria. When that part of the brain is triggered, the, the instincts, the impulses, are very significant. And so what we think happens is the prefrontal cortex, the things I should be telling myself about why I shouldn't take this. I'm sober six months, I'm just about to get in custody, you know, I'm doing well at work, I'm doing this. I'm doing th that part of the brain that should come into play does not come into play. To, to be addicted, by definition, means that those instincts are, are now screaming that you must get that substance inside again. And it has no rationality to it. So in every way, it is an illness. I think it's just hard for us to fathom because we, as humans, have this belief in control. And, and evolved people have it, and those that are not as evolved don't. And I think we kind of see it that way, that if you were, you know, if you had more willpower, if you were raised better, if you, uh, whatever, that you could exercise control over this. And, and I promise you, none of my patients suffer from lack of willpower. And science proves that opioids are addictive. These drugs did what they were designed to do. They changed the chemistry of the brains of millions of people. Their stated objective was to kill pain. They've caused far more pain than they've helped. Two years ago, journalist and author Beth Macy, a fellow Roanoke resident, met Patricia and Tess. Macy tells their story and that of many others in a harrowing account that traces two decades of one of the worst drug crises in American history. It's called Dope Sick. I heard it over and over from people who were struggling with, with, with opioid addiction. You heard that phrase? That is the word they use. Man, I'm dope sick. Or, man, I was dope sick when that happened. What's that mean? That means, like, excruciating withdrawal. Instead, Purdue continued to push it both as a beneficial painkiller and one that could be prescribed without fear of addiction, as in this testimonial video. We doctors were wrong in thinking that opioids can't be used long term. They can be and they should be. The way that this is, was being marketed uh, really was fueling the whole problem. Um, you know, and we had young people becoming addicted, going to jail, going to prison, just dying, families uh, being torn apart, and Purdue was giving out beachheads, oxycontin beachheads, to uh, physicians. And, writes Macy, physicians were over prescribing the highly addictive oxycontin don't believe we would have an epidemic today had a multifaceted campaign not have been launched that deceived the medical community about the risks and benefits of these drugs. So doctors were told you'd get in trouble, you could get sued, and you would lose money if you don't start treating pain. And so doctors were taught this, we felt like we had to, and so if you look at the number of prescriptions written, it skyrocketed about 15 years ago. Also at the same time that overdoses skyrocketed. So we know that there's a strong correlation between overdose death and opioid prescribing. At the same time, the pharmaceutical companies were saying that these medicines are not as addictive as what you thought because they're long acting. That error of the pain as the fifth vital sign is definitely a crucial part of the story because that's when a lot of this started. The reason that we started to use opioids for conditions where we never would have prescribed them in the, in the past is because we were responding to a brilliant, multifaceted marketing campaign that was disguised as, as education. There's no question that our best, strongest pain medicines are the opioids. They don't wear out, they go on working, they do not have serious medical side effects. In fact, the rate of addiction amongst pain patients
patients who are treated by doctors is much less than 1%. And so these drugs, which I repeat, are our best, strongest pain medications, should be used much more than they are for patients in pain. I got my life back now. Now I can enjoy every day that I live. I can really enjoy myself. And before, even a good day was hell. Doctors were wrong in thinking that opioids can't be used long term. They can be and they should be. We used to think they'd stop working or the patients would become addicts. These six cases show how wrong those views were. What do we learn from these six patients? Most importantly, they refute the myth that long-term opioid use would inevitably lead to addiction, tolerance, and passivity. It's not acceptable to say, I don't believe in using strong pain medications for chronic pain. We need to stop saying this. You're being told that they're not addicting or not as addicting and you don't have to worry about that. Also, you're being told that you're that person and you're that doctor, you're violating your ethics, you're violating the law if you're not prescribing these medications. What is the reason for not giving them? We didn't realize how addicting these were because the pharmaceutical companies told their reps to instruct physicians these weren't addictive. They could give them and they didn't have to worry about patients becoming addicted to it. So they were given for every minor pain. And we would have been much less gullible if we were hearing this from just from the sales reps for, for the drug companies. We were hearing this from our professional societies. We were hearing it from our hospitals. We were hearing it from our state medical boards. From every different direction, you were hearing that if you're an enlightened doctor, you'll be different from those puritanical doctors of the past. It turns out that these different organizations and some of the pain specialists eminent in the field of pain medicine who were promoting these messages had financial ties with, with opioid manufacturers. The reason they launched this campaign of, of misinformation about about opioids, the reason they deceived the medical community is they wanted a drug that would perform well financially. Oxycontin, extended release oxycodone, is a good drug if you're treating pain at the end of life from, from cancer, but a drug company isn't going to do well financially if their product is only given to people at the end of life with cancer. That's not a common condition, and the patients won't be on your drug for very long. If they're at the end of life, the way you do well with a pharmaceutical product is if you can get the medical community to prescribe it for common problems that many people have, and if the drug is used long term. What Purdue wanted when they were introducing OxyContin was a blockbuster drug. That's a drug that brings in more than one billion in sales a year. By their fifth year, they were bringing in more than a billion sales on OxyContin. They can't sell this drug without going through the doctors. They can't do it. And they spent all this money convincing doctors that their new time-release opioid was not dangerous, it was not addictive. Why did they do it? They did it to make money. And make money they did. They'd done it, though, by writing prescriptions that were not needed. They were not there's no way in Oklahoma that we can have 128 prescriptions for opioids for every 100 people. And yet that's exactly what the number is today. And while we here at Hello Land News have brought you information on this alarming trend, now it's become personal to all of us here who work at Hello. Hello Land's Angela Kennedy lost her 21-year-old daughter, Emily, to fentanyl poisoning in May. And there's so much stigma surrounding this. It's hard to even talk to other people about it. Everything in my instincts, everything told me something is seriously wrong here. And we would see Emily quite a lot. She wasn't living with us. She was 21 years old. 
Uh, but the more time I spent around her before her death, the more alarm bells went off in my head. I found out what she had been doing, the cause, it was unbelievable to me. The fact that my daughter would be using heroin and needles, my beautiful daughter, who was very privileged, had every opportunity in life, you know, to have a great life, had gone down this road. And it was shocking to me. I consider myself a wordsmith. I write for a living every day. But there are no words to describe the devastation I feel at the loss of my daughter. When you're talking about the opioid crisis, it could be anybody from a recreational street drug addict to a, a pastor of a church who gets involved in a car accident. People do scary things and people do horrific things. And when we see that stuff, we say, how could they? What were they thinking? Because we're using that part of our brain that evaluates behavior, that, that says, you know, we, we should be in control of our faculties, whatever those might be. Um, and that's probably one of the hardest things for folks to, to grasp, is that element of, of losing control. Certainly the criminal justice system has been ravaged by it with the volume of cases that we're seeing now where the root of the problem is an addiction to opiates. The theft cases, the breaking in enterings, the burglaries, um, at the root of a lot of those cases, when you get down to it, it's defeat and opioid addiction. It's permeating all facets of uh, the criminal justice system, for sure. This addiction is powerful, and it causes people to do things that otherwise they would absolutely have never thought that they would get involved in. This is new research breaks down the science of addiction, and the September issue of National Geographic is going to take a closer look at this topic. In the article, it's actually the cover story, The Addicted Brain, our next guest went in search of why, writing, quote, addiction is a disease, not a moral failing. It's characterized not necessarily by physical dependence or withdrawal, but by compulsive repetition of an activity despite life-damaging consequences. What you struggle with when you struggle with opioid addiction is that your brain is chemically dependent on those opioids. Your brain is releasing chemicals craving those opioids. But what happens when they take that pill is it changes the brain. Their brain chemistry is changed and their life is forever changed. The brain has this center that is natural and we want it to be there. It's called the reward center. And the reward center is the reason why when I eat a cheeseburger, I get a, a sensation of happiness. And that's why I eat another cheeseburger later on. It's because my brain has remembered, oh, that was a positive experience. You should do that again. It does that on purpose because the brain wants me to eat. The reward for that is small. When you take an opioid, it does the same thing, but it does it much, much stronger. And it lays down new pathways in your brain. And that causes you to seek out the substance again. The, these drugs act on a receptor. Whenever I injured myself, the body releases a substance called endorphins. Those endorphins bind to those receptors in the brain to block pain temporarily. Opioids have hijacked that natural system, and they do it so much better. So you're feeding yourself more pain medicine to try and get that same feeling, and you're always chasing your brain. So it tells me that Mother Teresa taking these medications would get addicted. It's not a personality flaw. It's not a character flaw. This is a, a biological mechanism that happens. The brain responds to things in the environment, and the brain responds to addictive drugs, to alcohol, to all the to behaviors that, that we get hooked on in such fundamental ways, and it really changes the structure of the brain. It affects the, the chemistry of the brain, the cell-to-cell the -cell signaling. So people are almost programmed to get hooked um, to these things that are so re initially so rewarding, but over time, as addiction develops, lose all pleasure and actually become a source of misery. The medical establishment it, is very, very clear on this point. It's a chronic relapsing brain disorder. It's not about 
weak will, it's not about moral failure, it's not about laziness. And it's something that once it takes over, it, it drives behavior. And even after those substances clear the body, someone's gone through a recovery. That's why we see so many people go through recovery and relapse and then try again, try again until they really conquer. Yeah, it's great that the president's putting more funding to this because I know people that have lost their children to this. And she was only 21. Uh, according to the autopsy reports, Emily had six times what would be considered a therapeutic dose of fentanyl for the largest man. And she was just a small young woman. She didn't stand a chance. I mean, that fentanyl killed her almost instantly after she injected it. It's the permanency of it. I was robbed of my daughter. I was simply robbed. We were looking at the symptoms of addiction. Families were watching a loved one who just couldn't seem to stop using. We would never look at a loved one who was struggling, for example, with an asthma attack and say, why don't you just breathe normally? The same is true with addiction. When you look at someone who's struggling with addiction and you say, why don't you just stop using? That's asking someone having an asthma attack to just make themselves breathe normally. We have to make sure that we actually look at the science and that will begin to take away the stigma of addiction. I've seen normal people turn into monsters and kill. I've seen people kill over this drug. The addiction is more powerful than anything that, that I could even describe. And I want her life and her tragic death to at least give someone else hope by telling Emily's story and my story of loss and pain and suffering. I mean, I'm opening myself up. I'm being vulnerable to our audience in a way I've never been before. But I do feel it's super important I do that. Because if just one person hears me, if just one person does one thing to save a life, then I don't care about a million naysayers or a million people who don't understand. I just care.